Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the IMAA's Insights and Innovation Series for this somewhat cold Monday around Australia. Today, we have the amazing MIQ, who's a great partner of the IMAA. We've got two speakers on their part, the amazing Stuart Parker, who's an old friend and uh, industry powerhouse, and Anthony, uh, it's Anthony Hess. And Anthony is um, a long-running member of the MIQ family and knows everything pretty much know about um, uh, audience, audience enablement. Um, I'm, the topic of today is going to be the future of audience identity. Uh, I will leave it to Stu to do a more eloquent uh, introduction. Uh, so I'll pass over to you, Stu. Thanks very much, Sam. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for making the time on a Monday uh, to invite us into your, into your homes and your offices to talk a little bit about um, some innovation and some insights around uh, data and enablement. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Stuart Parker. I'm the National Sales Director of MIQ. Um, so uh, I'm my remit is national and responsible for everything relating to independent agencies across the Australian landscape, as well as client direct. Um, also joining me on the call, we have Sadi, uh, who's our trade marketing manager, um, and Anthony Hess. Uh, Anthony Hess leads our sales enablement efforts at MIQ, and he's really the bridge between the commercial side of the business and the technical side of the business. My ring is purely commercial, so I'm the one with the expense account and, um, you know, who, who who kind of phones it in most days. Hess is the one who's um, really about where the rubber hits the road with MIQ and making sure that we're uh, utilising all of our products, um, data and solutions uh, to activate uh, the most efficient ways uh, between commercial and technical side to, of the business. Uh, in terms of uh, what we're going to do today, is we just want to take you through a little bit about who we are and what we do, and then get a conversation started around the future of um, data um, and the deprecation of cookies, uh, which has you know, obviously been a fairly hot topic for about the last 18 months. This is very much a matter of not if, but when. Uh, when that happens, what are we gonna do? Um, and we're mindful that you know, we've only got a slot here for a, about an hour. Um, we will aim to finish well within the hour and give you guys some time back. Uh, my learnings from video calls over the last 18 months is uh, less is often more. Um, and particularly on a Monday lunchtime, it's a it's a tough slot. Everyone's probably um, just trying to fire up after a, uh, a weekend. Um, so what, what we'll do is aim to move through this um, between 30 and 45 minutes um, and then leave some time for questions and discussion if, um, if there's that sort of engagement towards the end of the call. Um, so, that's sort of the introductions. I'm just going to give you, rather than giving you the full um, MIQ uh, sort of elevator pitch, we, as I said, we want to make this a bit more uh, educational and I guess relevant to what's happening in the um, industry at the moment. But I do have to do my due diligence and just explain who we are. Uh, so we're at MIQ, uh, we're a, a managed service. Uh, by managed service, I mean uh, a managed programmatic service. So we act a little bit like a publisher in the sense that we um, respond to briefs for agencies and clients. Um, and then we recommend solutions, and those solutions can take um, place or, or activate across anything um, or any media inventory that's essentially got a screen. Um, so we don't own any of the inventory. Um, we're, we're an intermediary. And, and importantly, we're not a DSP. Um, we're, we're a managed service. We have kind of three main USPs. Uh, the first is our, our proprietary tech, uh, which is um, modular and API-based. And that's just a sort of a, a fancy way of saying um, our tech lets um, other tech speak to each other very simply, and it doesn't rely on a single vertical um, integrated stack. So we can work with any number of tech partners or DSPs um, to activate where eyeballs um, are going to be the most engaged and, and lead to the most uh, beneficial KPIs for a campaign. Uh, so the first USP for us is very much about the, the tech. The second is very much about um, AI. So we've got great tech, but we've also got great AI, which automates things like um, how we bid, um, how we trade media, um, and how we pull insights um, and, and planning reports. So we've got a, a, a nifty planning insights tool called Intelligence Hub, which is essentially a, a seven day look back at what's happening in the, um, in the web universe. Um, think of it as a reader panel. Uh, we use this to gain insights and um, build strategies for uh, campaigns. Um, so essentially what we do is run data requests in the Intelligence Hub and, and use those insights to build out campaigns that start um, pre-optimised. So rather than going live with a campaign and then spinning the wheels for a few weeks while we try and learn uh, what's happening with the audience insights, we're fortunate enough that we've got this planning insights tool which lets us actually start the campaign pre-optimised. So we we could run very efficiently from from 
uh, the start date of any campaign. Uh, the third USP for us really is people. Um, we're, we're very well resourced, uh, both locally and globally. Um, we've got dedicated sales, trading and client service teams based in all cap cities around Australia. We've also got offices in Singapore, Germany, um, the east coast of the US, Georgia, um, Toronto in Canada, um, and of, of course in uh, London and Manchester as well, which is uh, where it all sort of kicked off. So we've got um, 16 offices across eight countries. Um, we've got about 950 people working for us across the globe. Um, and the, the secret source within the people, um, apart from you know having local representation or markets, is we've got access to 250 data scientists and business analysts. There's a lot of S's in there, um, which uh, are based in Bangalore, um, which is sort of central west um, India, uh, kind of near Chennai. Um, Bangalore is affectionately referred to as um, Electronic City, um, which is sort of their answer to Silicon Valley. Um, it's where a lot of uh, big organisations have, uh, I guess, data hubs, places like Uber um, and uh, Facey and all those sorts. The reason being is uh, the time zone in Bangalore is very well set up um, to be a central uh, global resource. It's sort of um, our afternoons are their mornings. Um, their mornings are sort of the, the US's and the UK's nights. So it's uh, very well located. And Bangalore also has a very um, well regarded uh, sort of education um set up for all things data science and business analytics related. Um, so what it means is that's not a sales team over there, that they, um, the, the data scientists and business analysts purely exist to crunch data and then turn it into actionable marketing um, insights that we can activate off. Um, so there's sort of the three things, it's the proprietary tech, it's our use of AI, um, and it's the, the dedicated resource we have um, locally and globally, both from um, you know a commercial and a technical point of view um, to really help us um, deliver on uh, campaign KPIs for, for agencies and clients alike. Um, we've been around in Australia for just over five years. We've been active globally for 11 years, so we're here to stay. We're enjoying a, a reasonable amount of growth um, over the last sort of three years um, and continue to expand our footprint in Australia. We've just opened a Melbourne um, office. We've got 12 people down in the Melbourne market. Um, we've got about 30 in the Sydney market and we've got about eight in Brisbane. Uh, we've also got representation. We've got four in uh, Perth and, and one on the ground in Adelaide. Um, so we're continuing to grow. Um, there's a continued investment in headcount, um, resource uh, and uh, you know offices uh, across the eastern seaboard. And we'll look to do the same in WA um, and SA as we move into 2023. So they're the big things about us. Um, we, um, as I said, we're a managed service. We can activate across any DSP. Primarily, we use sort of DB360, Xander, um, AWS a little bit, um, and the trade desk. Um, the, the, the key is with our tech and uh, with the resource that we have, we typically engage on the right DSP for, for the right for the right job. Um, for example, if we've got a client who wants to make sure that everything is um, tied up with Google, we're typically going to run through DV360. If we've got something that's going to be a little bit more video focused, we would probably activate through the trade desk because they've got very good uh, video enablement through their partnerships with, um, you know, uh, all of the uh, BWOD services and um, OTT services, as well as partners like Samba. Um, and if we wanted to go for scale, um, we would probably activate through someone like Xander. Um, so we're a bit of a Swiss Army knife in when it comes to programmatic, and we can use the right tool for the right job, um, which means we've got flexibility, um, uh, which is probably one of the hallmarks of what we do. Um, that's enough about MIQ. Um, I'm going to ask Kessie to move through the next slide, and we're just going to frame what we're going to talk a little bit about today. And it's really about the future of I identity, and I'm sure. Everyone on this call has heard about, um, you know, the, the cookie deprecation. And um, as I said before, it's not about if, it's about when um, that's that's going to come into play. And it has been, you know, pushed back a, a little bit, but it's coming. And it's something that we've been gearing up uh, for, for the last two or three years. Um, we're kind of excited by, by it. Uh, cookies, you know, have been the hallmark of programmatic for a good many years. But in our estimation, you know, that, that's always been great. And we've activated them for a good many years, but we've, always regard them as a fairly binary way to um, activate. They, they gave us something that we never had before, and it certainly um, gives us some accountability. Um, but very much of the DNA of MIQ is uh, ingestion of data and making sure that we're really using the, the right points of data um, to, to build out a, um, uh, an accurate and efficient uh, marketing campaign. And to do that, we, we need to look a, a little bit beyond just cookies. Um, so next slide, please, Hesse. 
So as we all know, it, it's it's coming up and, and when it happens, it's certainly going to change the landscape. But I don't think it's going to happen as quickly as um, perhaps uh, a lot of the pundits uh, have reported. Um, and the good news about it is it's going to open up a, a huge amount of opportunity uh, to, to delve a little bit deeper into the data side of things rather than just, as I said, that sort of binary um, activation you can do with cookies. We have been looking at this for a good many years. We've been looking at solutions like um, data bunkers. Um, we've been looking at solutions with um, uh, other third party providers, uh, one of which is LiveRamp, uh, who have the ability to ingest huge amounts of you know, data like CRM data into a, a, a sort of an anonymized um, uh, safe environment, which we can then use um, to build off of, um, which we'll talk a little bit uh, about later on in the presentation. But I think the, the key here is, um, you know, the deprecation of cookies isn't anything to be scared about. It's something to be embraced and certainly something that we're, um, we're very keen to be um, at the forefront of at the moment at MIQ. Uh, next slide, please, Ezzy. So programmatic is um, been around for a little while now, and it sort of means different things to, to different people. But look, in, in its purest form, I think programmatic was always, you know, the silver bullet was always going to be about getting the right message to the right person at the right time. Um, and that's sort of easier said than done um, or, 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 you know, historically has been. Um, but programmatic is so much more than that for us. Um, you know, programmatic is not just about getting in front of the right eyeball. It's about generating uh, rich data sets and understanding how your customers behave um, and we're able to do that through uh, leveraging you know our access to data scientists and understanding uh, what sort of uh, transaction behavior is happening on you know various uh, clients and partners sites and then really analyzing that data to uh, create meaningful and uh, uh, activatable marketing insights um, it's all also about making changes uh, in real time to direct the data that you're generating. So I think one of the um, one of the key things about programmatic is, you know, don't set and forget. We've got to understand, you know, when a market changes, and I think that's never been more evident than it has been in the last 18 months um, with the ubiquitous na nature of COVID. Um, when a market shifts quickly, you've got to be able to um, understand what the, what the data is telling you and, and, and activate based on that change in real time, which is what we can do as well. Um, it's all also about finding the right questions uh, to get the right data and insights you need. Um, typically, when we engage clients um, to learn a little bit more about their uh, organisation from a data and solutions point of view, um, we're asking a bucket load of questions. The first place we like to start is by doing what we call a data audit, um, which is, you know, in its purest form, is about us asking what sort of data points do you have and and what sort of data do you have access to and then letting that data inform uh, the sort of decisions that that you want to make as a business and that we want to um, make as a, a sort of a, a campaign strategy um, it's also about using flexibility of programmatic to generate the answers and as i said before the the nature of miq's um, flexibility means that we can use uh, any number of data partners um, and any number of um, data points to find the right um, to run find the right uh, media mix for the job, um, so flexibility is an absolute key for us, um, and all of this uh, goes into uh, solving a, a business challenge. So rather than starting with the answer, we typically start with the question, uh, and we always let the data inform inform our uh, inform our solutions. Uh, next slide, please, Jesse. So uh, those of you. Uh, who have been around long enough, um, I'm putting myself in that category well and truly, will probably recognise this bloke, Henry Rollins, who was the lead singer of Black Flag, uh, sort of a fairly revolutionary punk band in the late 90s. Um, Henry Rollins is uh, well known for his uh, outspoken views and his spoken word pieces as much as his for his music. But one of his famous sayings is, um, you know, creating problems is easy. Um, we can do that all the time. But finding solutions that uh, last and produce good results requires guts and care. And that's kind of what, what um, what we're talking about here is we we really want to find solutions that will last uh, last for the long term, and uh, we we don't really just sit on our or rest on our laurels and do the same thing hoping for for different results. We're constantly questioning and interrogating the data we have, uh, not just from a, a campaign uh, architecture point of view or when we're responding to briefs, but what what we're doing day in and, and day out as well. And that certainly comes to the fore when we're talking about um, you know what. Uh, what uh, data and analysis is going to look like in a, in a cookless future. Um, so it all, always comes back for us to, to looking at what the data is telling us. Um, a nice little analogy for this uh, is uh, a, a fairly well-known story from uh, World, War, World War II. There was a guy called Abraham Wald, 
um, uh, who was part of the Air Force. And uh, in World War II, they were having a hell of a lot of, uh, the US Air Force were having a hell of a lot of problems with their planes getting shot down. And they didn't really know how to, how to solve it. Um, and this guy, Abraham Wald, um, started doing something fairly revolutionary, which was trying to understand where, where the planes were getting hit. And, and what to do with it. So what he actually did was started recording when planes came back from battle, he started recording where, where the bullet holes were from the dogfights in, in each of the each of the planes. And he started to build up a fairly significant um, sort of set of data from you know uh, hundreds of planes coming back. And then he tried to find a commonality uh, in the data. Um, and he could actually start to mark out where these planes were typically getting hit, which, you know, in sort of 19, 40, 1941 is pretty remarkable, um, a pretty remarkable way to look at things. And what he did then was he mapped out on a typical bomber uh, where uh, where the hotspots were for bullet holes. And I think that's on the next slide. Hesse, we can see um, he could really um, map out uh, on the fuselage and the wings where where the bullet holes were typically um, being hit. And he could see that there was uh, there was a pattern emerging. Can we just move to the next slide, please? Hesse. And there you see it. So it was sort of the tips of the wings um, and around that main area of the fus fuselage um, where, uh, where the bullet holes were hitting. So what he did then was use that data um, to inform where they should put the armor uh, on the planes. Um, and so around those areas, they, they reinforced um, with you know, additional steel and uh, aluminium um, around the body of the plane to make sure that those areas, that the areas you can see in red, uh, were more heavily reinforced than the rest of the plane, which then resulted in, um, you know, those planes when they got hit there were far less likely to, to um, sort of been blown out of the sky. So this is very much at the at the beginning um, of, of World War II, uh, the the strategy they used based on a data set um, that was fairly basic at the time um, to to sort of gather, uh, but then they used it, which was the most important thing, and that's what we sort of um, are trying to do with, uh, you know, the, the deprecation of cookies is we're out. Of, um, at the forefront of it, trying to understand what the implications are going to be, um, where the hotspots are, and how we can uh, sort of make our um, our offering bulletproof for a cookless future. Um, next slide, please, Hesse. So, um, you know, that's just a little analogy to say, hey, when you've got data, uh, it, it's a good thing to to understand it, interrogate it, but then importantly, to, to use it. And I think that's one of the things that's uh, particularly been challenging in the Australian marketplace over the last 10 years. Um, it's about, um, the data's always been there, for, but uh, for the most part, but it's about the interrogation and, and the utilisation of that data um, and, and how, we, um, how we activate off the back of it. I think about, you know, five, six, seven years ago when uh, we were working with partners um, across the media industry, and a lot of clients had a bucket load of data, but were very nervous, for want of a better word, to share it. Um, and that's really flipped on its head in the last sort of two or three years. We've now got partners who are saying, "Hey, look, take all about, take all of this. This is everything that we've got. We just don't know what to do with it." Um, and that, as I said, one of our huge USPs is the access to data scientists and business analysts who can, you know, ingest that data, um, interrogate it, and then you know, turn it into something that's uh, an actionable marketing um, insight that we can activate off the back of. Um, we're doing the same with that with, with data and identity as we move through um, you know, our partnerships with people like LiveRamp and uh, you know, data bunkers to understand uh, what a cookless future could look like. I'm going to pause for a moment here and throw to Hesse, and Hesse is going to talk to you a little bit um, about what this looks like in uh, sort of real working examples for us. Thanks, Stu. Um, so I'll you know, just to give a bit of background around a lot of the examples that we're about to go through, a lot of it was built around the idea that there was fixed ideas of what the data was telling you. And we aim to build this presentation initially to showcase that data is agile, both in how you cut it and how you apply it. So you may have the answer, but it may not be the complete picture. And re reshaping the data can be an important tool to help you find, you know, the full scope of the picture. Um, so this was an old example that it just resonated with me. I can't remember even where I read it or how long ago, but it's always just stuck as an example. And it was from, um, a, a pie company in America, which, you know, they used to sell family size pies at all your local supermarkets. And, you know, they, they had the data. They said, Apple was the biggest selling pie. This is going to be the favorite. So when they decided to kind of broaden their marketing opportunity and cut down to single serve pies for the individual, 
they're like, cool, we'll make the most amount of Apple because that's what we always sell. And when they launched in market, what they found was that they actually had a surplus of apple pies that were left. They couldn't get rid of them. They couldn't figure out what to actually do with this. And they're like, hold on, hold on. This, this is not what the data told us. The data told us that everyone was buying apple. And now that we've got single serve, you know, we're seeing cherry, we're seeing blueberry, we're seeing rhubarb. Um, I'm pretty sure reading the article, there were some fruits I'd never even heard of in there. Um, but it didn't make sense to them because they weren't looking at the full, the full scope of the data. What they actually found out was that apple pie was the most agreeable flavor. You know, some people prefer, you know, their kind of, as I said, the fruits that I didn't even know. My partner, I think, would go straight to rhubarb, whereas I would definitely be someone that would go to cherry or blueberry. The individual choice meant that the data needed to be reshaped to fit this specific product. The marketing team never actually considered that when they were going into their level of production. Um, did I hear something come up in the chat there? These slides are making me hungry. Sorry, Ben. Sorry. If this was in person, I would have provided pies to really illustrate this point, but we'll have to do that next time. Um, yeah. Ultimately, the data said one thing, but it was only a single scope of the data. What was believed to be the entire picture actually meant that we needed to reshape the changing trends for the changing products, the changing marketplace. And that's such an important thing. Um, and it's something that we come across I mean, since reading that article, God knows how many years ago, it's something I come across every year in a different way, shape or form. Um, cookies being a big part of that. And in particular, the focus is on the new kind of iteration of TV. So as we see cookies deprecating and the importance of TV continuing to flourish and grow for brands, we actually really need to reshape the way that we look at TV data because TV is no longer just flip, flipping through the channels. The more that we look at that data and the expansion of how how consumers view TV in you know what we would consider TV, a lot of this is actually on mobile, on desktop, on apps. Um, it's no longer the same. And so when we actually broke down um, an overview, and this is actually just looking at kind of data that through different partners, you know, we actually saw that advertising on traditional TV became oversaturated. I think uh, one of the data sets that we looked at was one client found, or maybe as like a market average, 90% of TV advertising was only reaching 50% of the TV consumers. Um, you know, it was, that's not where the bulk of TV watchers are. And, you know, I, I as an individual, I can tell you all my TV watching, it's either on Netflix or YouTube. Um, so there's a completely underexposed market, which I would fall into that watches TV in a non-traditional way. So similar to the pies, while the history and the legacy of television is looking specifically at, um, at actual televisions and traditional like channels, there are more ways that people actually consume that now. And we need to consider the changing the way that we even define television and looking at that broader scope. Seeing that as a main shift in the, in the, uh, the industry and the landscape, we've partnered with Samba. And this is not meant to be a sales pitch. This is just for context that... Samba um, is a data partner that is able to collect through digital TVs. I think they have 180 to 250,000 in Australia at the moment. That actually is able to pull in data, looking at like the IP address, the types of channels, the types of content, and we can actually start to build a picture and understand how many people we're reaching and extrapolate that data to build a bigger view. Why that's really important is because using that same IP address, we can then map back to any activity that we're running through a DSP. Any connected TV Samba campaign that we'd run would be through the DSP. So if we then run a YouTube campaign, we can look at the Samba TV data and we can understand the true reach of a campaign by considering how many households we were able to reach and using that data set to pull in the IP addresses. We don't need to necessarily build a robust profile in terms of you know what are their what are they doing each bit of the day. We can actually start to use the same data that we had before and cut it in an entirely different way, linking it with what we do on YouTube and understand where that incremental reach is. And this is something that we've done for a client and is now rolling out across Australia. Um, it's, a, it's a huge innovation. And for me is one of the things that got me excited because as I said, I don't watch TV. I've probably seen seven ads on television and that's because I just happened to be in the room while my partner was watching MasterChef or Married at First Sight. Um, be perfectly honest about that. The uh, some of the TV choices I'm not sure I agree with. But 
at the same time, we're looking at things on YouTube where that's where we're watching a lot of like content that may not be available here. So we've now had to redefine the way that we look at that landscape. We've changed the data. We've recut it into a different way to build out a profile that's going to help service our, our um, clients. And this is a hugely important thing because the base data is still the same. We're just shifting the way that we look at it. We're being agile with how we kind of build our definitions to adapt with the market. And that for me is quite exciting because I find a lot of the clients that we're working with haven't really necessarily taken that step. You know, are they missing the trees for the forest? Only looking at the, what they believe to be the big picture, but it's not entirely true. It's actually just, we need to focus on other elements that we may be missing within that data set, within those profiles, within the changing trends to build in a much bigger and more robust picture. So this leads on to another one of my favorite case studies, um, which kind of goes into the idea of not relying on linear thinking. And I think that past example, that last example was a really kind of good, good innovation in terms of, you know, TV viewers don't just watch TV on TV. So where else can we reach them? It's the start into breaking down linear thinking. And the thing that really triggered this for me was uh, Coldplay which again, seems like a really weird example. Um, but there was a period, I think it was around 2010, where it was believed that Coldplay was impacting the stock market, most specifically Citibank, which when I read this article, I thought, what a load of rubbish. They're like, how, how is that even possible? The picture, the bigger picture that we need to look at all the data set, Coldplay was signed to EMI records. At the time, EMI was very much struggling, but Coldplay was the band that was keeping them afloat, which meant the success of Coldplay really impacted the entire success of EMI, whose core investor was Citigroup. Citigroup, most commonly known for Citibank. So anytime Coldplay did something, it would have a knock-on effect that would impact the confidence in Citibank as a whole. And as an example, the first week of a single release after a heavy downfall saw, saw the first uplift from Citibank uh, share price index in God knows how long that was. Oh, this was 2011, sorry. Um, anytime that they made an announcement, there would be an actual change within the stock prices of the Citigroup share price. Now, I read this and I think a lot of it, you know, correlation versus causation, but it does inspire the idea that things outside of your control could have, be having a bigger effect. Not everything is a direct line, and you've got to consider that non-linear approach to what could be impacting your business. So for us, we started taking in that thinking as well. This was something that we ran for an insurance client. Um, I think this was back in 2017. And what we actually found was that sales in uh, Sydney increased uh, when it was raining. And it's not any particular type of insurance. It was just general insurance. And we couldn't figure out why this was. And ultimately, it was just over a certain level of precipitation meant that people just didn't want to go outside. And so this, in particular, on the weekends, we would see a huge uplift in um, the number of people signing up for quotes for this insurance because going outside was just so miserable. You might as well use that time to get your admin done. And we were able to build that into an activation. It's not something that was related to the product. It's not something that necessarily made sense, like at a very top line point of view, when we cut, kind of broaden the scope of, actually, if we look at mobile data, there's less people going out and about. More people are congregated in residential areas. That means more people are at home and online. And so we could actually build in a correlation on that and use that to activate our targeting. We were thinking a little bit outside the box and not just relying on, all right, well, who's our audience? How do we target that specific profile? It's let's look at the behaviors of things that don't necessarily rely on cookies. An example of how we're pushing this now, and this is again using that um, example that I had with, uh, that we mentioned with Sam, but part of that data set means that if, because we're collecting the data in real time, this is a data feed that gets updated every two hours. We're now, we were working with the body shop. I think the campaign finishes I think it's at the end of this week or end of next week. But ultimately, the body shop is kind of pushing their activi activism and trying to build in a lot more of a profile of engaging environmentally concerned youth. What is the best way to do that? And so one of the kind of the insights that we got from them, you know, activism is a three-year global initiative. This is the, the kind of launch of it. Um, supporting the voices for youth. 50% of the world's population is under 30, but only 2.8% are in political office. 
in the wake of the recent election and the huge topic of conversation around climate change, the Body Shop uses this as an opportunity to actually promote their new initiative as well as their entire range by retargeting users that had been shown multiple ads. I think it was during the peak of the election, it was up to 10 ads within seven days and then serving them an ad for the Body Shop to be able to get involved with the Body Shop activism. So we were actually able to retarget TV audiences by using this new data set. We didn't need to identify our audience because somebody else had already gone and done that for us. We just used a data set that enabled us to build in a profile of saying, well, this is what these users are engaged with. This is how we can continue to engage them while they're in that mindset. And the idea was to piggyback off of somebody else's targeting and profiling and using the data that was available to us there. Really exciting because something like this I've never actually seen before. And I've only ever, in the cases where I've seen something close, it's predominantly just retargeting on a display campaign. We're looking beyond the cookie here. We're looking beyond, you know, what does this profile do? What are, what, you know, what are they interested in? You know, what are these pure definitions? And redefined how it's like, well, these people are seeing a lot of political content, therefore they might have an inkling to be more engaged with our political position. Let's serve them an ad there. And it, I, I love the outside of the box thinking because this was something that was proactive from the body shop. And going back to Stu's point about asking the right questions, it wasn't, can you run a TV campaign for us? It's how can we best engage these users? And this was a solution that we were able to bring forward as part of the test of this new product. So the question that I would put out there to everyone is what is your cold play? What are the connections that you're missing? What are different ways that you could think about the data that you have or the way that you understand your audience in order to reshape the data that you do have into a way that's gonna make sense in a, in a new approach? For me, being by being driven by the data and setting yourself up with the right tools, you're preparing yourself to capitalize on the future of identity. As Stu said, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, you know, one of the things that's quite exciting for me within my role is that MIQ is very proactive in making sure that we're ahead of the curve in being able to tackle all of this. And part of my role is being able to kind of work with brands that are open to the question rather than prescribing the answer to say, well, we need to think differently about how we define our audience and how we engage them. And finding that solution is probably going to be the most exciting part about that because it requires you to think differently about something that you may already know. You're relearning a learned skill and a learned idea of who that target audience is. Losing the cookies is not the end of things. It's just an entirely new future of identity. And it's one that puts privacy first, but brands that are most prepared for it are really gonna be able to succeed. So this is kind of what we do and where we fit into this. You know, We help bring that unique proposition to market we have the people and the resources to bring these bespoke solutions. So Samba only have a partnership with, I think they only launched their third partnership in Australia um, about a month ago. So as a partner, as Stu said, we're agnostic. We run across multiple DSPs. We're able to leverage our size as a global business to help tap into the data sources that you need. And if it's something that we don't have, we'll, we can do that. Many of these solutions came from just working with a, pro, a client about a proactive approach to what we can do, and then make sure that we're delivering on that performance for you. I know this isn't meant to be a sales pitch, but it's for me, it's very much a philosophy that those cool things that we got to talk about just now were only possible because of the open minds from partners like yourselves that hopefully we'll get the chance to be doing more. But ultimately, you know, cookies are going. And I love to throw in an LCD sound system or just a music quote in general, but everybody keeps on talking about it. No one's getting it done. We're here to help get it done. That is 100% what our role is as a partner. So hopefully you guys got some value out of this and interesting ideas, maybe some learning or at a minimum, some entertainment during your Monday lunch. But just want to say thank you for tuning in because I know that's a lot for a Monday afternoon. Thanks very much, Jesse. Any questions? Or Stu, do you want to um, encapsulate? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Dan. Look, uh, thanks, Hesse. Hesse's, um, as you guys can probably see, Hesse's, uh, you know, very much the conduit between technical and commercial, and he's got an incredibly good head on his shoulders. He he can offer a, um, uh, the, the sort of more technical part of MIQ uh, to my commercial part. Um, so thanks, Hesse. That was lovely, um, uh, lovely done. Um, guys, we're... Um, 
we're, as I said, we're a managed service. Um, we're, we're known to a few of you. I can see a few names on this call uh, that I recognise. Um, but there's a lot that we don't. And one of the reasons that we've partnered with the IMAA um, this year is to sort of help grow our footprint uh, across independent agencies in Australia. Um, that said, uh, we often understand that the first engagement with MIQ is very much about education and what, what do we do? What's act, what do we actually do as a managed service and how do we activate programmatically? Um, we can tell you a little bit about that as we have today, but honestly, the, the best way to contextualise what we do is just to get in touch, um, shoot us a brief, um, ring us up for a chat, um, pop some time in the diary um, if, you, if you just wanted to learn a bit more about us. Um, we understand that um, you know we, we're not going to win every brief that we get or, or we're not going to be the right partner for every agency that engages with us. Um, but what we typically find is that once someone tests us, uh, we've got a very high retention rate because you know, MIQ in its simplest form sort of just does what it says on the tin. Um, so there's no no surprises. We're completely transparent with the partners that we use and we give you all of the media metrics um, uh, that we activate against. Um, we're completely brand safe. Um, we're, you know, all, always human eyeballs. Um, and we use, you know, uh, verified third party sources like Moat um, uh, and IAS to, to verify all of that as well. Um, but look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. The um, key takeouts for us is that as a managed service, Think of us as a Swiss Army pocket knife. We can use any DSP, we can use any tech partner, we can ingest any form of data. Um, and we're always here to help. Um, so just reach out to us directly or, or through Sam and the team at the IMAA. Um, but thanks very much for your time. If there's any questions, I'll happily take them now. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll leave everyone to crack on with, um, uh, crack on with their Mondays. Uh, back to you, Sam.